In order to keep you on your toes, I must be kept on my toes. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, how are you guys doing tonight? Yeah, that's the enthusiasm I expect. I'm just one disappointment after another, so this is a really great start to my set. Before I get to the main meat of what I want to talk to you guys about, I wanted to bring up something that has been on my mind a lot lately. And I was having a conversation with somebody a couple weeks ago, and we were having a discussion about various political issues. And one issue that came up was medicinal marijuana. Yeah! And fucking hippies. <laughs> you are my hero. <laughs> Did you ever know? <laughs> but anyways, I had an issue with something he said. He said, I don't like marijuana. Marijuana is a gateway drug. Yeah. Well, that can pretty much be said about anything, really. Take coffee, for instance. Coffee is a gateway drug because at some point the coffee is going to stop doing something for you. Then you move on to the harder shit, like espressos, cappuccinos. <laughs> Judge me if you want, but I lost a lot of good friends to the latte in a flux of 2011, so don't tell me shit about gateway drugs. <laughs> so now I want to talk to you guys about something that really required all of America to be on drugs. I'm going to talk to you guys about my next segment of my political comedy series titled, If He Gets Elected, I'm Leaving the Country. And the title of this is Part 8, Rage from the Machine. Yeah. <laughs> and so, let me just warn you guys about something. The next 25 years of presidential administrations are painful in one way or another. Extremely painful. Like listening to Jimmy from South Park try to sing American Pie painful. <laughs> for those of you that can probably have a more relatable joke, for the guys out there, have you ever been taking a shit and you just had a sudden pain hit your balls? And it was like five seconds of excruciating pain, but it felt like five minutes. That is what the next 25 years of political administrations are going to be like. Just one giant ball pain after another. Start and the first one starting in 1876. The election of 1876, ladies and gentlemen, America was 100 years old today. By the way, happy birthday, Jennifer. Not a hundred, but... <laughs> Aren't we all? But we were a hundred years old, and we decided to celebrate our hundredth birthday with a good old batch of corruption, ladies and gentlemen. That's the American way. That's the American way. And in order to give you a kind of reference point as to what was going on, I need to bring you back to the election of 1824 with a guy named Henry Clay. Now this cocksucker, he decided that he was going to make sure that John Quincy Adams was made the president because he didn't like Andrew Jackson. But he wasn't just going to win in the presidency. Oh, no, 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 no. He wanted the Secretary of State position in return. And this quickly started the spoil system that ran rampant through our country for a good long while. And it's, yeah, to an extent. But it got to a point where the spoil systems met with the Industrial Revolution to create what was known as a political machine. And on the political machines, they had all the money, all the power, all the ability to decide who gets in what position. And this all imploded on itself during the election of 1876. Because that is when we got in Republican nominee Rutherford B. Hayes. Now here's something I want to talk about real quick. Rutherford. It made me think, we haven't had any presidents named Michael, have we? <laughs> Michael is such a well-known, popular name, yet we've never had a Michael. We've had a Millard. We've had a Ulysses. We've had a fucking Rutherford, of course. And now, our current president is named Barack. 
Our president is one letter away from being a Mortal Kombat character, and yet we have not had a president named Michael. <laughs> I'm glad that at least some of you got that one. Thank you. <laughs> now, the, the reason that Rutherford Hayes won the election is because there were a couple states where the ballots got miscounted. Guess which one one of them was? Florida! Well done, ladies and gentlemen. You live in the suck country. The suck country. God bless. Now, either this is one serious act of corruption, or it proves more about education about the educational system in Florida than anything we could ever do. We can't even count our ballots. Yeah. Two times. Two times we have forgotten how numbers work. And it's not like it's one guy. If it was just one guy who's counting all the ballots, I could give that a reprieve. But it's hundreds. Hundreds of people count these things. So obviously that had to be the option because corruption in the White House, oh no, that never happened. <laughs> so we have Hayes, and the problem with Hayes is that he meant well, and usually when you mean well, you're a shitty president. <laughs> Very rarely has there ever been a president who meant well and had a good presidency. Carter. As I said, you're giving, you're giving me more material, so... Kennedy, he got killed. Exactly. Yeah. FDR? FDR meant well, yeah. meant well and did well. Yeah. I'll get to those ones later, so don't you worry. But mo yeah, most people don't really remember anything about Hayes. He is such an unmemorable president, even at the time, nobody gave a shit about Hayes. Because they knew that his election was just a complete fucking sham. Yeah. And more people paid attention to his first lady, Lucy Hayes, because she was pretty much a new form of first lady. She was extremely religious, and so it led to three big things. She banned dancing, Good. she banned gambling, Good. and she banned alcohol. She banned alcohol from the White House. And so in order to, and she just, but also there was something very innovative about her. She was the first lady who decided that we should have an Easter egg roll at the White House to get everybody's mind off of how they're not drunk right now. <laughs> So he didn't have a very successful presidency at all. The Republicans didn't even want him back. And so they decided on a new candidate, a reform-minded person named James Garfield. And James Garfield, that's going from mad, going from Rutherford Hayes to James Garfield is going from mad to sad. Because James Garfield had potential. He was a reform-minded candidate. He was a guy who was willing to fight against the political machine. Second shortest term ever. Second only to William Henry Harrison, who got his, who got out of office because he was completely incompetent. Mr. Oh, I'm not gonna wear a coat during a rainstorm. You've deserved to die, dumbass. You have a medical degree. You have no excuse. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but with Garfield, he, the election of 1880 to begin with was kind of a semi-corrupt one because a lot of Republicans didn't like the idea of a reform-minded candidate. Ironic, probably, considering that the first Republican candidate we ever elected into office was very reform-minded, Abraham Lincoln. And so... Yeah. <laughs> and so the Republican machine was trying to work against him, and the only state that he could count on was New York, which was run by a senator named Roscoe Conklin. And they had a couple of problems with that that they had to overcome. First of all, in order to appease Conklin, 
he made Chester A. Arthur, who was Conklin's right-hand man, his running mate. I'll get to him in a second. But also, he wanted to be sure that Conklin was well aware that he could come talk to Garfield about anything, and Conklin made it known right away what he wanted. I want to be in charge of the New York's Custom House, which was the big money-making, power-broking bit at the time. Hall. Yep, pretty much. Garfield agreed. Garfield wins. Garfield says, go fuck yourself, Senator Conklin. <laughs> Because he not only, he not only didn't give Conklin the job, he gave the job to a Democrat. That is a big fuck you. Yeah. To give the job not just to somebody, but to someone from the other party, go fuck yourself. And so Conklin and Garfield had this big rivalry up until July of 1881, when a guy named Charles Guiteau shot Garfield. <laughs> and Charles Coteau is my favorite assassin, by the way. He is my favorite of all the assassins. <laughs> fuck Oswald, fuck Booth, Coteau. That's my guy. Because this guy was nuts. He was so <laughs> insane, it was hilarious. Because he, this is when the spoil system really implodes on itself. He worked with the Garfield campaign. And so he felt, I deserve a job because I helped you win the election. Garfield didn't give him a job, and then God told him God was a big problem at this point. God was responsible for everything from 1860 to 1890. Civil War, act of God, into slavery, act of God, murder of Garfield. Guiteau shot Garfield, and Garfield would have survived if it wasn't for one very important factor. Doctors at the time were fucking stupid. <laughs> they thought that the germ theory, which was just a theory at this point, had no merit, and that cleanliness was a minor priority. Yeah. This led to Garfield getting an infection and dying. They stuck their hands in there. And this was bad news for our next president, Chester Arthur. Because he, up until this point, was a professional cocksucker. <laughs> he went up to everyone and just said, hey, how can I suck your dick today? <laughs> he was not only Roscoe Conklin's right-hand man, he was also one of the most corrupt men who ever lived, ladies and gentlemen. He was in charge as the collector of the Port of New York City, and he was fired because of extortion. When he was made vice president, nobody expected his career to have anything after that. He was pretty much done. Garfield died, and then Arthur had to go through what we in the hallucinogenic community call a cosmic epiphany, which is what happens when every element of the universe collides at one moment to make you question something about yourself. So it's like, the universe as a whole just looked down at him and said, you're the president now. What the fuck are you going to do? And he had to rethink his morality. And so he passed the Pendleton Act, which made it a crime to give a political position based on your relationship with that person over personal merit. Which brings us right back to fuck you, Conklin. Because that was just a giant middle finger. The guy that you worked for, you were his right hand man. And you pretty much say, yeah, I'm gonna make sure that the thing you want never ever happens ever again. Fuck you. And so, he also had one defining feature, which I can't talk about Chester Arthur without bringing up. His glorious mutton chops. Chester Arthur, if you ever see a picture of him, he has the most badass mutton chops you have ever seen in your life. Every president, with the exception of Andrew Johnson, up until William McKinley, had facial hair. The Gilded Age? More like the Bearded Age, am I right? I not only feel disgust for saying that joke, I feel a little bit of shame. <laughs> Which are two things that our next few presidents needed to have on hold. Thank you guys very much. I've been Art Zager.